Um, first thing, can you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your uh, profession. My name is Daniel Rai, uh, and I'm a Danish photojournalist. I uh, work basically on humanitarian issues in all sorts as a photographer. What made you get into photojournalism? I started as a, as a gymnast, and uh, and while I spend all my time in in gymnastic, uh, like in gyms all around the world doing gymnastic, I got bored when I didn't do anything else. You know, when I didn't do gymnastic, and I started to take pictures, and slowly it it started to evolve into yeah a profession in some at some sort. So um, that's why I. I started. What were some of your um, your projects that you covered when, throughout the years of your career? I worked uh, I worked for a, a Danish photojournalist uh, as an assistant, and he brought me. He introduced me into these, yeah, to the world of working in in conflict zones, and uh, I continued. I went to Russia to do a small project and. And then I started in in the south of Turkey to to work with the with all the refugees, and and then I decided to go inside Syria to to make a story about all the you know about the people before they come become refugees, when when and why do they actually flee the country? That was why I went into Syria. So you and Jim had pretty similar drives for this, the, what you wanted to do in Syria. I mean, you guys are kind of covering the same situations. At the time when I went into Syria, and and also when James and Jim he, when Jim he went into Syria, there was not much media coverage of the conflict, not in Denmark, uh, um, and you know we heard a lot about the issue in the. You know, when uh, when everything evolved uh, in the Syrian revolution, but after a few years, you know, people start to forget the the conflict, even though it it was still a very big issue. So one of the reasons why I I went there was to to you know remind people what was still going on, um, because the media tend to go the same places, you know, and suddenly when a conflict is not sexy anymore, all the all the, the big world media goes away and some people stays there to continue covering it. And, and that was, I believe that was why Jim was there, was to remind people what was still going on. Did you guys um, talk about your stories when you were together? Or? We spoke about our stories, we spoke about what kind of stories we, we have done so far and about journalism. Um, I don't... James, he didn't, he didn't tell much about his, the story he did in, in Syria. Um, I think for him it was difficult to find... It's, it's difficult for me to say because I don't really remember, but I remember he he told me a lot about the the work he did in uh, in Iraq, and uh, and while he was embedded with the with the Americans, um, so um, James and and John worked together at that point uh, in Syria, but I I don't remember. We we didn't speak so much about the stories inside. Syria at that point. Before you were kidnapped and you were in Syria working, was the temperature of the situation, do you feel it getting more dangerous? What, what happened in Syria and, and what, what is happening at the moment is what started as a, like a revolution where, where you know all the students and all the people around Syria started to rise up against the regime, you know, suddenly I guess that people started, you know, the whole situation turned into something that a normal, the normal people don't, didn't want to be a part of anymore. 
which means that a lot of people who actually started the revolution had to flee away. And in the end, there was just these Islamist groups and, and criminals left. And I think that that's the, the vacuum that at least I got caught in was what's the change from 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 the Syrian revolution being a a very a very beautiful rise up against the, the regime into being you know f fight between warlords and Islamic groups etc. So it becomes a, a very yeah everybody for themselves and not not a population against the regime. Everybody has their own interest. Mm. So I believe that was that was what everything turned into and and James uh, was 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 the first one getting caught together with with John and and we knew that other people have been taken before but but also released shortly after. So of course you know there is a risk and there was a risk in Syria. But I don't think that anybody knew that the risk would be you know, the consequence it could be that. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about how you were, when you, the day that you were taken, and what that was like, a picture of that day? I started my project in the small town, five kilometers away from the Turkish border, uh, the small town called Asas. And uh, I only planned to be inside Syria for, for two days. I wanted to get in there and, you know, kind of test my my fixer and the people that I was using, try to get some, establish some contact that I could, so I could have some contacts on the ground to continue my research. So basically my first trip was much more like a research trip than it was an actual, you know, it was actually working. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, um, I had one day of, of work when I walked around this small, quiet town. This, yeah, it was May, spring. So the weather started to be very better and people seemed happy and relaxed. And everything was pretty much calmed down. And we visited some locations everywhere. We went back to, to the house where my, my driver, he, uh, he used to live. Now, he lived in Turkey at the time, but he had a, a abandoned flat in, in Assas, and we slept there, me, him, and, and my, and my um, fixer. And uh, we um, woke up the next morning very early. My plan was to, to work. I wanted to, to, to meet the Syrian morning routine and meet people in the market or whatever they, whatever they were doing. And... Um, and yeah, basically, we walked down the street and down and st try tried to meet some of the local on the street and and uh, we were told to um, to go and 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 speak to to some guys uh, in the area and and my Arabic is very pure and uh, is very poor and uh, I yeah. And I, uh, yeah, I trusted my fixer, and we went there to to speak to them to make sure that it was okay that we that we filmed in that area or were taking pictures so that we worked as journalists. And she made sure that no worry, then everything is fine. They're good guys. They've been helping us a lot. They, etc. etc. And um, and we went in there uh, to speak to them, and after one hour of of an interrogation kind of thing. Very, very calmly we were sitting in sofas, they were offering tea, everything was calm and quiet, even though I knew that something was strange, something was wrong. Uh, and then they just asked me to stand up. And so I, I stood up and they took off my glasses. And, and they just, don't worry, then this is just a procedure. And they took, gave me a blindfold on and handcuffed my hands on my back and followed me down the basement. And when we came down um, uh, into the basement, I was put on a mattress and then everything started, basically. So 
for me, uh, I knew it was dangerous. I I spent a lot of money and on in like covering myself, like kidnapping insurance and and rescue insurance and stuff. Uh, I knew there was a risk, and I knew I was I was new in the game. I I knew that I was, you know. I knew that that uh, that 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 I didn't have the same, uh, um, what do you call it? I didn't have the same um, routine. I didn't have the same um, as a, you know as a very um, like like an old like an old journalist who have been covering the same in many years. They they know temperature of the area you know i i knew that i had to 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 learn on this so i i really tried to cover myself but in some way i i got caught up in this political uh, vacuum the vacuum that there was appearing in in this area and and i was taken by the upper um as far as i know and yeah that was how everything began so you know, a quiet Sunday, beautiful spring morning become became a, a, a nightmare for me. I don't think I've had anybody explain what a fixer is. I don't think a lot of people know. What is a fixer? A fixer is is uh, is a local person, a translator, a, you know, a, a guide, a tour guide in a way. Uh, that you contact and and they will take you around they will they will help you out with the story so if you say okay i need to talk to people in a bakery they will take you to the baker and they will usually know know the people uh, at the location and introduce you and 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 give you the latest news and and, and the situation uh, in this area so that's kind of a guided a guide or an expert uh, that you can use um, as a, a foreign reporter at this location. And so how does one go about finding a fixer? I... Uh, I... Um, through a friend, I, uh, I got a contact to one guy and I met up with him, I spoke with him and talked about my case, my situation and, you know, I... You make a background check on this guy, make sure that he is uh, that he is trustworthy and that you can rely on him. That he's not just a, a guy who will, you know, sell you away for for the first group that that you goes into. And uh, and the guy I used uh, was very reliable, and I knew that he had been working for Human Rights Watch, uh, uh, CNN, and, you know, a lot of all the big media, so I found him a very reliable and and through him he, he gave me a contact to the person who was the best in that area and um, um, and I met up with him in, in Turkey and we hung out and yeah, was supposed to have two days inside and then back to Turkey and back home and you know, think about everything what do you want to do? What is what is the story? What prepare the next trip basically? So I was very aware to to start slow before I started to go into something that I couldn't control. But sadly, the yeah, it turned out different. And then and you saw, you also have and I know, it's the same with Jim. So you have a fixer and then you have a driver. Mm. And is a driver just kind of like a like cabs, and or do you have someone? You have these two guys that are kind of you hire to. Yeah. The um, driver is simply someone who drives you. My driver was a local guy from Assas, so he ha also had a flat that we could sleep in, and um, which you, if you are local, then you know more people, I guess. So he was also a kind of a stringer fixer for me, you know. I could use both of them, or they used each other, and they have worked together before. So we were basically a group of three people who who worked together, and I was. Uh, so I, I I had a good feeling uh, using them. They they were cool, calm down. They were very, you know. So 
Absolutely. After you were captured, um, you know, the, the time in between your capture and then meeting Jim was actually, now that I know, it's quite, it was quite a bit of time. Mm. Um, but, you know, the first day, you know, the first day that in, in captivity, like that first 24 hours, like, what is that like? Like, what was kind of going through your head? And the first... The first 24 hours for me was, was, was strange, you know. The first, the first two, three hours was, was very confusing. At some point I thought, okay, this could take two weeks, it could take one week, it could take two days, you know. I've heard a lot of other stories, read stories about people who have ended up in the same situation and, you know, Everything between three, four days and one and a half month, they would be released again. And, and I knew that I had a insurance, etc. So I knew that somebody was working on my case if, if it turned out to be worse than it was. And, you know, I, I, I didn't really think that much. I didn't really... My, thought, my first thought was, okay, the only thing I can do now is to be patient. The only thing I can do now is to just stop thinking about everything because I cannot do anything about anything. The only thing I can do is to to tell the truth if they ask me uh, and then just find a routine, play the game and yeah, and everything will will sort out in some way. I, I was pretty sure and, and uh, they start to get they, they got a, 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 like really tough on me, but they put me in back in the car and I was basically sitting right next to my, my driver. I could hear him. Um, he was sitting right next to me. Uh, he was crying a lot. And uh, the fact that he was crying made me calm. It made me like I could really, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I felt comfortable and I felt calm that he struggled that much and I so I, I basically I, I became kind of tired and I was like almost sleeping in a way but I was really tired and at that moment I really I really thought that that they were going to execute us on that right away I thought they will take us and shoot us and that was it because they accused me of being a spy. Of course, they do that to everybody, but but uh, I was a young journalist and didn't have much. I mean, my name was not everywhere. I didn't have a big media behind me. So I don't know, maybe, I don't know what they wanted to do, but, um, but they didn't. They didn't take us out and shoot us. They took us into a basement and I spent like one week with my driver and then he was released. And uh, and I continued uh, being inside, and um, it was um, yeah. The first the first time is always the, the the toughest because you have to first of all it's I was shocked, like in completely shocked. I didn't know what to believe. I didn't know what not to believe. You know. Things just happen and you're just completely out of your mind. If they do just small things, you will be completely out of your mind and, and afraid that, that that will, like, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? But slowly, when time goes, you, you start to see which thing they're doing again and again, and you get used to and you get good at being a hostage. So first is the for me it was the shock, and then you start you start to you start to um, you start to um, to fit into the situation. You start to um, how can I say this? Uh, you start to be um, adapt. Yeah, yeah, you uh, you adapt into the situation, and then um, and then suddenly this this whole thing becomes a part of your life, 
and this is your life and then in the end it's yeah if if you can see there is some kind of um, symbols or proof that you're going to be released uh, no some if there is any signs that you're going to be released then you start that phase but for me it was the shock adapt and then accepting this is your life so the longer you are uh, a hostage you easier it becomes in some way you know the better you get at it then you know that you know just because you didn't get any food one day you know it doesn't mean that they want to kill you for instance you know that could just mean that they just forgot you or whatever you know it's very easy to to go crazy in your head so that's that's how I so more time that passed the, the easier it got in a way and and the more professional I got when, um in between, um, still in between, before you kind of met the group, were you, uh, you know, how many, where were you moved around a bit before you, you know, I guess, before you met a, another Westerner, or when was the first time you kind of were, were uh, joined, put into another, into a jail or a cell with, with someone that you could speak with? I had around uh, three weeks before I saw the first two Westerners. Um, so, at the, the, there wasn't a, like a long period of time where I didn't, but then I saw these two West, Westerners for like a few days and, and then we were taken apart again and I had like, I think one, one and a half month by myself, together with only local Syrians, um, where, where they taught me a lot about their you know, their culture and traditions and what to do, what not to do, how to behave and so I could adapt to the to the yeah, to to all the the Syrian uh, the Syrian um daily life in a way. So I didn't stick out as being a, too much of a Western arrogant asshole but being a a humble, clean in that way, you know, what's clean here is not especially clean down there so so they taught me a lot about how to how to be a part of of, of their culture so that was very interesting and then uh, after I believe two and a half months I I was put together with the with two other westerns and and then we were put together four like I think we were five together and then seven together and it came another one eight so after yeah, three months we were eight together and then it just started to evolve and in the end we were sitting 19 guys together. That's really interesting about that you were a month and a half with you and Syrian prisoners. <laughs> did they ever tell you, did you ever, or did you have conversations with them about why they were there? Did they tell you their stories? And yeah, there was... Some, like amazing stories from their, like, their point of view. What really helped me by meeting them was uh, there was only a few of them I could speak to, and there was one guy that was that spoke very well English, uh, but I was only with him for like ten days or so, and then I I learned some Arabic words and like I managed to communicate with them in some way, but but it was very interesting to hear their stories and especially to hear their views on this whole issue thing. Um, and basically what I, what I came to find out in Syria was why people become refugees. Why did they leave their home country? Is that because of bombings or, you know, why do they leave? And, and meeting them in that prison was basically the answer to that question in many ways because they left in constantly fear either to be taken by the regime or be taken by Islamic groups uh, in as being either a traitor or done something wrong or, and a lot of them you know it's difficult to get the the real story because you're sitting in a cell with them they would never tell you the truth of why they were there uh, so of course, as you say, everybody is innocent in a, in a prison, 
but uh, but most of them they they told me why they were taken and and that was everything from one guy was told that he was once friend with a, a regime police officer and he was seen talking to a regime police officer like half a year one year ago and he was uh, he was a carpenter and he had four kids and he was uh, sitting with me for for 25 days and at that time and at that point uh, I um, the, the guards had, was told not to hurt or harm me because I was being released or I was being negotiated for. In the beginning I was very close to being negotiated out. So uh, while I was with these Syrian guys, I was basically about to be negotiated out, which changed because Islamic State suddenly came into the picture. But anyway, I, I didn't, I, I, I was not treated the same way as they were and they were treated very badly. And all of them continued saying like, this is not real. Islam. This is not real Muslims. This is, this is warlords. This is criminals. This is crazy people. And uh, and uh, another guy. He uh, he didn't have. Uh, he was he was not uh, Shia. He was not an Alawite. But he was uh, like a fourth branch of Islam, uh, a very small brand uh, branch of Islam, and he. Um, and he told me that they came in one day and his brother-in-law accused him of of being a wrong Muslim, like he was not praying the right way or whatever. And, and um, they took him, his wife and his younger son and, and they told him right away that they killed the wife and the son and they put him into the into a cell with me and i have never seen such a, such an honest um, muslim in my in my life you know he was he was praying five times a day of course but every time he was praying he was he was he was crying inside he was and i told him something and he told me something and i asked him if if they ask you about some of these things that I've told you, would you would you tell them? And they say, yeah, of course, because I cannot lie. I'm a Muslim. I can't not lie. That's against my religion and my God. And he was so so religious. You know, he was he was an amazing person, and and uh, he his English was very well. And I I really used him a lot to speak with and cry, cry with, etc. Uh, but uh, he was told that his son as his wife was was um, killed and he was treated he was treated badly and had to do some videos for them uh, saying that he was a, a spy for the regime and like he was um, um, yeah he was um, oh, what is it called when they the regime agents called um, oh, I can't remember but yeah uh, that he was a uh, um, uh, an agent for the regime and and that this group Japan had taken him and blah 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 so he had to show himself as a as a like he was lying on the screen and he came in to me and he said, Daniel, they, they told me to say these things and, you know, I, I cannot say it because it's not true and they told me that they will execute me if I didn't say it, but if I say it and they release me, I will get killed in a few days because people are thinking that I might be a real spy. So he was like, like, whatever I do, I'm, I'm fucked, you know, I, I didn't do anything. I, I used to work at a bomb factory that was shut down, so I'm just sitting at home and and trying to, you know, get the best out of my day. And he loved his wife, his kids, you know. He was really, really honest person, and he was just caught in this in this deep shit. And, and that, you know, whoever I spoke to, it was the same stories, and and people were like, this is not our revolution anymore. This is not our our war, you know. This is this is. A fight between 
you know, people with wrong intentions and, and the regime. Um, so that was it was really sad to sit down there because they didn't know, they didn't have any hope, they didn't have anything to to look forward to. Either it was the regime or it was some Islamic groups. So. Whatever, mm. you know that was. But that was really, really interesting. And and by meeting all those those local Syrian guys inside, also made me realize that my that that I was not the only one sitting in this situation. You know, I decided to go down there. I decided to leave my secure country to go down there and you know they was taking out of their own homes their own beds you know i decided to go in there so why should i be sorry for myself i had a lot of money in my back pocket to get me released they had nothing you know some of them didn't even have like a thousand dollars which were their release ransom and, and then if they didn't have the money they would just get killed and so i really I really learned to to understand that this was not about me. It was not about Daniel. This was about, you know, it was, this was about other things. This was much, much bigger picture. I was just a small pawn in this. In this, um, I was just a small, yeah, a small piece on the chessboard, uh, and that really helped me like understand the situation from a perspective in a way not feeling so sorry for myself because i knew that there was thousands and thousands of people having a much worse time than me were you released or moved on to the next jail did you ever know what happened to him or in some of them they said to me hey we're going we are going to be released now and and they got in and they gave gave them their wallet and their cell phone keys whatever you know, it's it's it was like, hey, we're going to be released now. I just have to get twenty uh, whips with a. Um, I just have to get twenty um, lashes, and then and then I can go. And you could hear them get these twenty lashes, and then we'll, they will be get released. You know, so I I it, I couldn't tell. I haven't spoken to any one of them uh, since. I tried to get in contact with 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 some of them by remembering emails, but. You know, there was like 11 months from the time that they left the prison and, and I was released or I left them. Uh, so I don't know what their destiny were. But I hope they were released and and are living a quiet life now. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. You know, they, they could have been told, hey, you're going to be released now and you'll go out and let's shoot them. I don't know. You kind of combined with a, a lot of the Westerners, and what was when was the first time that you that you encountered Jim? I was put together with the other hostages, and they told me that there was a guy named named Jim, and there was a guy named John, uh, but they were kept in a at another place. They didn't know, but they saw them, and and one day when I think we were sitting like seven guys together. We were taken to the toilets, to the bathroom, and James and John was standing in um, in the same toilet. You know, there was I don't know if they were supposed to, the guards were supposed to take them back to their cell, uh, and then we could come in, and they just forgot to take James and John back. But um, but uh, they uh, suddenly we came into the cell and and. And at that point, I was very, very traumatized by 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 the torture that I witnessed the first the first three weeks of my detention, and so I was just like in the background, not saying anything. And I looked at these two guys, you know, standing there, um, and I don't remember that much. So, um, I remember I remember John as being uh, like John. Seem said like, hey Daniel, I've you know, hey, nice to meet you, you know, uh, heard a lot about you or something. He said something that 
you know, why did you say that? But he was just, I think both of them was like very happy to see that they were in the same prison as we were. I think they were afraid that they were probably in another, like that they were not a part of our group. So both, both of them was very happy to see us. And James was standing a little bit in the background and just saying hello, hello, hello. And I don't, we, maybe we, we were there for like one minute, one and a half minute and, and they were taken back to their cell. But I managed to see and I remember the impression I, I got of, of James was, was like, um, he looked really, uh, he looked really, uh, what do you say? He looked really confused or like unintelligent. But I, you know, I created this this picture in my head of this big like war journalist, you know, uh, and <laughs> so I I could only get disappointed in a way. But but he he I remember him being like, oh, uh, what's happening? Yeah. So that was the basically the first time I met him and um, and. Um, yeah, we were taking that part again, and and the second time time I I met I met James was in uh, uh, I mean, I think it was in the 14th of October, I believe. Uh, either 14th of October or 14th of November, I can't remember exactly, but um, either one of those dates, uh, James and John and. And another guy came into uh, to our prison at that time. I think we were, yeah, we were like ten guys or so together. This is a completely another prison. We moved a few times, and and they came in. And first of all, I thought that, I thought that they were giving us that the guards were giving our, our, us mattresses because suddenly they, they came like we had to to sit faces to the wall so but I could see like under my arms I could see like um, I could see um, some mattresses was moved in and, and there came some guys in in uh, like uh, traditional uh, Syrian clothes and, and, I, and I thought okay this is just God coming in with with like mattresses for us we have been asking to to get something to sleep on because we only had a few blankets um, and then they closed the door again, the big metal door, and, and I looked up and there, you know, there was three mattresses and standing three guys in like traditional Muslim clothes. And, and that was James and John and, and this other guy. And uh, I was like, holy moly. And everybody was like, yay, welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, it's uh, three new friends. Uh, the ten of us already got each other on the nerves, so it was nice to have somebody else to talk to. And finally, uh, we saw jo James and John for real, and they were part of of, of our our situation because I think all of us was afraid that that they would have another destiny or something. And the fact that they were put together with us meant that. At some point, we'll probably have the same, you know, destiny or the same. There was already, there were already starting to go some negotiating, some some negotiation was already started for 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 some of us. Uh, my the negotiation that happened for me in the beginning um, uh, failed. Uh, you know, we were. We were taken from Japan and Nusra and over to Islamic State, as far as I know, and and then my negotiation collapsed, and they tried to start something again. Um, so some of some of us uh, already knew that what they wanted to do with us, and the fact that James and John came into our room meant that hopefully they also had the same destiny. You know, it's just about money, uh, and it was really. Like both for James and John, they were really, really happy to be a part of the group because they were afraid that they had another destiny, and so that made everybody like calm down in in a way and made everybody much more relaxed. When Jim and John and this other um, guy come into the room, mm -hmm. um, they enter into a situation where there's already 
etiquette and manners and rules maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, as a group of, of you know, strangers and, and people who don't know that each other real well, how do you start to kind of create a community of, of rules and sanity and what, what is that, what is that like? You know, if we, we tried a few times that people was put into our group, basically directly from the street. Um, so when you, when you come directly from the street, you know, you are in this shock period, you know, you don't know what's happening and you, you know, you think everything is worse than it is, etc. And um, the longer you're in there, the more cool you become and the easier it is to, yeah, you, you develop into, you, you develop a lot of technique to, to um, get through the day and so it was really different to be put together with James and John because they basically was was the most experienced of us you know they've been taken for one year at that point I've been taken for only uh, for only eight months or so at that point uh, six months I don't remember but uh, other other guys were only taken for like a few months, so they were very experienced when they came in, and they have really tried a lot of different things and and different prisoners and prisons and and they really they were really good at dealing with all this. Um, so it was they when they came into the prison, they, they were they were they were very strong and they were very trust trust trustworthy. They were very um, they were strong, so we, I started from the beginning, and I think the whole group started to to lean a little bit against them, uh, because at that point the group was the group was very unbalanced in a way. It was difficult for us to 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 live together uh, because we had different opinions on, on everything, and we were a lot of young guys, and only a few older ones. So it was very. It was very good for the group that there came two older guys into the group that could that could level out the, some of the issues that we had uh, together. And both James and John are very calm guys. They don't speak up unless they are asked to, unless they have something to say. Uh, they're very cool guys, so they they really managed to to affect the group in a very very good way and um, and for myself personally um, you know I, I needed somebody to lean against as you know I was very very broke I was really broken down after my first three weeks and, and it was difficult for me to to get up again and to to start to believe in myself and, and to start to to gain strength uh, both physically and mentally, but but when James and John came in, I, I started to use them as guys that I could come to if I had a question or if I if I was angry about something, and and uh, and they you know they already always had a very good answer to me when I came to them, um, but uh, James he started to speak a lot to Stephen because both of them was American. They started to speak about their homes, their own languages. I really think that Jim, he said that it was amazing to see some from his own country. Um, that made him feel a little bit closer to home in, in some way. So I didn't speak that much to Jim in the first, the first weeks um, uh, we were put together. And the same with John. John was very calm and, and, and leaned back uh, doing all this yeah, during this time, um, but slowly, um, slowly, me and slowly, I started to get along with James because James is, you know, we 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 were all very different uh, in there, but I I could see myself in James in some way, you know. I think now I have met his family and, and my family, my mom and James's mom, they remind very much of each other, you know. He comes from this, you know, 
quiet, like very like strong family with with close relations to each other, very healthy childhood, etc. Like a normal childhood, he was raised like any other kids around the world, I, exactly like me. I didn't come from, you know, any crazy environment or whatever. You know, we 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 were raised in in the same way and. We were taught the same ground principles of, of life, you know. It's about, you know, it's... Uh, so I could see my own, my own life principles in, in, in James. And, and when I started seeing that, I, yeah, we, we started to, to speak and talk much more uh, together. And one of the strongest thing, I, uh, or one of the things I remember is that that uh, as I I am a, a former gymnast and I spend a lot of my time uh, training gymnastics and and working on my body on a very high level. So one of my jobs in in, in the um, in the prison became became to be this you know this gymnastic instructor in a way. And, and there was period of time in the prison where we where we was not uh, interrupted by the guards very often. We were in the basement. We had our own toilet in the in in, in one of the, the in one of the prisons. We had our own uh, toilet, so we didn't have to go to the toilet very often. So we were only interrupted when when they gave us food or when when uh, they just came to bother us, you know. But but we had a lot of time for ourselves, and, and that meant that we could get a routine. So the routine was that. Um, that I I did some gymnastic lessons uh, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. I did gymnastic lessons and and Stephen uh, he did yoga every Tuesday, um, Thursday and Saturday and Sunday we were off. So that was a part of our routine. You know, Stephen and I we 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 had something to 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 give the other guys and and I started to I tried to you know. I, I have big, great experience as being a gymnastic teacher, and I used to have students, very, very high-level students, and and trying to have a, to teach a, a group of war correspondents and war journalists and your workers, etc. In gymnastics, it's 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 really it's really something, you know, because um, they're much more intellectuals than they are like sportsmen. So it was very, very interesting and. And especially James, uh, you know, he he has a strong body, but he's not that good at at coordinating uh, and controlling this big and, and strong body. So it was really, really interesting to uh, to try to to teach James to to do to to do a roll on the floor or do a, a headstand or whatever we tried. At that moment, we were given very, very little to eat, very little to eat. Um, and uh, I don't know, like maybe five, six hundred calories a day. I don't know, but, but it was very little. So it was really, really starving. And, and we couldn't do much gymnastic every day. And then we'll be very tired, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I remember that. I remember one time when when I, when we need to have this uh, when we were supposed to have this gymnastic lesson, and uh, James he came up and he was he was ready you know ready to date Daniel everything is I'm, I'm I'm really good and and then we started slowly it was maybe only twenty minutes of uh, or twenty five minutes uh, this lesson but we did the first two. Uh, Two tricks and uh, and then James he, he couldn't really do it it was it was too difficult for him so he came up to me Daniel I'm 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 really uh, I'm really tired you know I I didn't get much to eat so I, I think I will sit down and, and grab a little bit to eat and and then he sat down on the car and I said it's, it's fine by me so he sat down on the carpet and he took a quarter piece of bread and three olives he ate that. And uh, and then he came back. Now I have the energy to continue. And that's perfect, James. That's perfect. So so he continued and he tried as best as he could. And that was. And and then you know I remember, five like, three months after that we looked back to this situation, and and, 
and we laughed our asses off because of Jim that couldn't use his body and then he ate a quarter piece of bread and three olives and then he was the strongest guy in the universe, you know. It was just so far away from from a normal world as you can get, you know. This we always had a lot of fun by by, you know, be, being held captive for one year or like this long time you <laughs> you the, the whole like what's normal for you and what's what's the normal you know changes completely you know it's of course it's normal to shit in a bucket or it's normal not to get anything to eat or of course you know it's normal to lay on on the on the concrete floor and and doesn't have any rights or whatever you know of course that's normal you know they've been like this for the last year so we really developed into be some really 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 strange people and then at some point we managed to you know having conversation to takes two two steps back and and start laughing our asses off by looking at this whole scenery of of madness you know it was, it was amazing but um didn't also um james he um Another st strong memory I, I I have about the first time with James was when um, when um, you know we it, it, we had this prison where there was a toilet in the corner and then it was just a concrete floor and small like small windows like this on the top so there was a little bit light but at this time it was during the winter period so it was very cold. Uh, um, and we were we were a lot of guys inside this this small room, so that kept it a bit warmer. But but it was very cold, and the electricity was very uh, was um, was very bad. So sometimes we could have electricity for two days, and other times there was no electricity for one week. Um, so during the daytime it was no problem because there came a little light through the windows, but. But at night, sometimes the light just shut off, or there was no light at all. So we were just sitting there in completely darkness, you know, no, didn't know what to do, which basically just waiting for food. And, and that time really, really, really went slowly, because we couldn't do anything, you couldn't just walk around, you couldn't, uh, you know, um, interact with anybody. So. What we did, James and I, we started to develop a way of, 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 you know, passing through these hours of darkness because both James and I was starving and we loved food and we was that was so important for us. Some of the other prisoners was was much better to to like they didn't mind the food issue as much, but but for James and I was. That was something important for us, you know, and I don't know, all of us has different issues um, to deal with and, and for, for James and for me especially, it was it was the food issue. So we, we developed a way of, of, of killing the time basically by, by giving each other like massages. Um, but there was something, there was something nice about it. It's, it's difficult to explain, but I think that but for me, it was it was the fact that you could actually, you know, I come from a gymnastic world where where we used to give each other massages because our body was, you know, really really pushed to the limit all the time. So for me, it's normal to 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 touch uh, other people. But James comes from a society where it's it's not that common in a way, and and we spoke a lot about women's and about, of course, our normal life at at home and. And and James asked me, hey, can, can you teach me how to give like a real nice massage so when I get out and I meet a woman, I can I can really impress her, like so I can be like this awesome uh, handsome guy who just know the women's not that I do at all, but but I I knew a little bit what the Muslim was and how you where to push and everything, and so we started having these kind of lessons. Uh, um, every night, so when the light came off, we could 
crawl into our corners and 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 we we spoke a little bit while we were doing this and for me especially it was and I also think for James you know we our body had witnessed a lot of trauma and, and we really you know you your body when you get used to getting hurt a lot of places so the fact that somebody is actually touching you and it's a nice feeling it's something that that my body had to get used to again in a way so for me to stay sane in the prison it was not only important to speak to other people and have a conversation but but it was also important for me to actually touch be touched and touch other people because that's what you do you know normally you do it with your girlfriend uh, but here we don't have any girlfriend of course it was not don't 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 get me wrong but it was it, for me it was a, a, a nice way to feel a little bit human again uh, because there's so little thing to do in there except talking and and uh, and walking in circles so the fact that we could do that it killed the time and and James and I we came a bit closer to each other and and James he never <laughs> learned how to give a proper massage it was awful every time so he really he really managed to uh, to get a good deal out of that one so um, so that was that was amazing that's something i really look back to as 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 a, a strong memory because that was something that only james and i had none of the other wanted to do it and they were like oh, that's strange and stupid and disgusting and you know uh, and i i didn't give a shit and, and james didn't give a shit either so we had uh, we had our time um, Doing that. So, can you just tell us who uh, John Cam John Camley is? And he's he's a lot of things. Uh, he he is a, a photographer. He's a photojournalist, um, which specialized in, in in conflict and war zones, and uh, have done a lot of work according to that. But he he's also um, like a former like motorbiker kind of things. He had a big career in, in riding motorbikes and 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 it, and uh, he worked as a photo editor, no, as an editor on a on a, a sports magazine, like a, a motorbike magazine in, in in Britain where he's from. Uh, so John has like millions, millions, millions of 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 crazy stories from his life as a motorbiker and and um, and he ch decided, like some years ago, to to change from sitting and being an editor at a motorbike magazine to be a, a photojournalist. And he really hit that hard and be become became very 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 good at it. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so so John is um, John is a very very intelligent amazing and and very interesting guy to to listen and listen to uh, and also talk to and why are john and jim always kind of spoken together john and james was uh, was taken together um they were kidnapped together so they have been together for ever since day one they have never you know they were never separated at any point they were always together. So um, the f it was very interesting to see what happened between James and John, because you know, because they've been together for for almost a year. When I first saw them, that meant that they have spoken about every single thing there is to talk about uh, between two guys, and and probably a lot of the stories they have told each other five times and and they always laughed telling the story saying that that one time John was about he John told that he was he was he was strangling James because he he was so boring to listen to <laughs> he told this he told John the same story like three times in a row 
And uh, and John just became so angry at him to like just say something interesting for fuck's sake. And he started like almost to fight James until there was a guard coming in. Hey, what are you doing? And and they were like, uh, oh, we're just uh, you know fixing something. <laughs> so they were really really like like to they were really interesting because the time we were together they 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 only spoke to to each other very rarely and and that was about you knew when when James and John spoke to each other that was because there was something to talk about there was something you know they didn't there was not small talking because they've been small talking for a year there was in a nice way you know they had a lot of wonderful stories to tell about each other and there's no wonder that they they loved each other more than anything you know there was those two guys had something special uh, to each other um so when i so i was basically the one starting to listen to all james's story again yeah, so steven sudlove is is um, an american journalist he's um he's a big nerd to say it correctly he's really 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 um uh, well informed and he knows everything there is to know about uh, the situation in the Middle East. So every time we had a a, a question or we discussed something, you know, Stephen he had the answer. So he was like he was like a book uh, walking around and and very every time we played trivia or, or any other games where you have to to ask questions or answer questions he he always won big time because he's very very competitive and he's very very intelligent um so he's he's really all he's uh, i've never met anybody like him and he's he's american like really american guy but also he's very very a very lovely guy and and he's really really funny in a way you know he's it's, it's difficult to say, but he, when, you know, he can, he, ha, he can laugh about himself because he really has some very, very strange issues in his head. You know, he can be really, really, um, what do you call it? Um, um, he can be really tidy, you know, everything has to be clean. He can be really... We call it uh, when everything has to be in order and 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 look very very tight, uh, and everything has to be clean, and we need soap and whatever you know, and and it, it can be way too much. But he has he has a lot of it's it's difficult to explain, but he is he's really quite a guy, and he can and he's. But he can laugh. He can laugh about himself, you know. He can. He can see the funny things in all his strange feelings and ideas and way of looking at life. And you, we had had the, the weirdest discussions in between each other. I remember one time, all of what we was. I think uh, Stephen and another guy was discussing about, uh, like how you can. Like if if the if the um, if the keyboard thing in in the flight, you know, the the monitor, if it doesn't work, can you can you write to the to the flight uh, thing and 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 get get some refund or get your your money back or so and and all our, the European Europeans we were like no no you will never write you know if it doesn't work it's it's okay you got your flight anyway and. And Steam was like, no, if, if it doesn't work, you will write to them and you will get your money back. And we had a huge discussion, just discussing that stupid subject, you know. And that was one out of a million big discussions where it was Stephen against the rest. Uh, so that was, we really spent a lot of time, uh, you know, using all Stephen's, uh, you know, weirdnesses uh, in a way. So he was, he was, um, he was very interesting to be to be in a room with. Can you yeah. talk about some of those things that he brought to brought to the table and in the group and and, and, and to you? Mm -hmm. 
James James was what was special about James was that he always took himself a second. Uh, he was he was always he made room for others before he he started to say anything. So James would only say things if if there was quiet in in the room. If if you didn't say anything. In, uh, so basically, you know, a lot of the rest of us, we will talk all the time. James, he didn't actually speak that much all the time. He was very good at, at listening to what was said. And um, and I, I remember, um, I remember that, that I was, I was at some point, the, the situation, in uh, in the prison was very calm and very steady and 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 I needed something to keep my mind occupied with. So I asked uh, I asked Jim if if you know do you want to to teach me Spanish because I, I would like to speak a third language and uh, and James was like was thinking about it and he used to be a teacher so I knew that he had the skill to 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 help me with this and the patient to, to help me with this but and um, and he agreed to to help me and and we uh, we started to have like 20 minutes every day of, of Spanish where he yeah he taught me the basics and and then I could spend the rest of the day just you know, practicing the words inside my head, coming over and asking him again. So that that became a, that became a big part of of my day. Was I really really look forward to 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 the Spanish lessons with with uh, with James because it's just it's when you're sitting there and you didn't and you don't get that much food, etc. It's and there are so many other things to worry about. It's actually difficult to to put your mind into one subject, you know, that you have to do. You know, he was he was teaching me this man is uh, so he was not getting anything. He was just repeating himself again and again and again and being a little, very patient with me, especially because I'm very bad at languages. But um, but he really managed to to be patient with me and, and take the time every day to to teach me this and and I know that other people tried the same and I tried with other people as well and they didn't have the patience at all but but James really managed to to look away from his own needs and 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 he was I think he enjoyed spending the time with me when we didn't think about it or talk about anything else than than, than this language and um, and we managed to do that for I think for one week and for one month, but but then suddenly the the whole situation changed and and I remember we were taken from one prison into a truck and were driven like across the the sta the the con the the country and. And I remember that when whenever we were moved around, you know, you never knew if they wanna they gonna they were about to split us up or whatever. So I was I was always trying to be so close to Jim as possible. Uh, and one reason was because of the Spanish lessons, but another reason was that no matter what, I I could get something out of him. He 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 liked to. To help me uh, speak to me or listen, so so I uh, somehow tried to to get to be as close to him as possible whenever we were moved. So if we were split on two, I would be in the group with with James. We were we were never really split up again, and yeah, but the situation just became too to um, what I call it, to unstable the situation just became too unstable and we couldn't we couldn't get our minds together to do it so we stopped but but we killed a lot of hours doing that the most difficult parts of being in a 
in a jail is is it's very easy to react. It's very easy to say something. It's very easy to do something. The the diff, diff, difficult part is not to do anything. The difficult part is not to say anything. Uh, Especially when you really want to say it, and when you get angry, or when you get frustrated, or you know you want to be part of something, and and for me, when you're sitting 19 people in one room, there's not room for everybody to speak. There's not space for everybody to speak. So whenever you're speaking, you you better have something to say, or, or else you're basically wasting the other guys' time where you're just creating a lot of noise and and James was very good at at speaking when he had something to say. Uh, he was very good at that and he didn't just you know he wasn't very loud and he wasn't he didn't react very much. Sometimes he he actually he was too patient and you were like, come on James, say something or do something, you know, and he was like, yeah. Something. It was very, very, very calm, uh, which made it very, it was very, very nice to be in the same room with him because he gave other people, you know, he, ma he managed to make the room bigger in a way by being small himself. And, and, and that, that is a, a very, very difficult thing to be a place like, a place like that when you really want to scream in the head of everybody like, uh, and yes. so, so James was was very he was very silent uh, most of the time. He managed to make um, make a lecture on uh, on uh, on American history and uh, also a lecture on, on literature lit literature. Yeah, uh, and it was so funny because we. We used to say that that we had these lectures, and and it was important that every one of us contribute with a lecture, uh, and um, you know to to pass the time so we can give away. You know, it's easier to listen to one person talking than ten people talking. So, uh, and yeah, I remember the MC. I think he spent like two months preparing his. His literature lecture, you know, uh, um, every time he was like, "Okay, um, it's 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 I'm working on it. It's it's about to be ready." And, and John will say, "Okay, James, uh, so are you are your lecture ready yet?" And he says, "Yeah, yeah, it's soon. It's ready soon." And then two weeks later, you know, "Are it ready?" Yeah, yeah. It's about just about to be ready. You know, he was very he was very humble in that way. He didn't want you have to ask him if he wanted to go on and do the lecture before he did it. But he, you know, and he did both the the, um, the American history and the, and the literature lecture, and it was it was very interesting because suddenly you saw one side of James that you didn't usually see. You know, if if a person is very in your face all the time, you you tend to know everything about that person like this. Uh, which can be a little bit boring if you're inside for such a long time with one person. But but James managed to. He was so yeah. He was quiet and humble and and very very slow going. So in in a way, yeah. When he when he did this lecture, I saw a new side of James. A, 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 a guy who could stand up and who could speak in front of a group very well spoken, very organized, very precisely. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. Um, and he really managed to 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 keep the group quiet for for the period of time, which is not very easy in a place like this, when it's so easy to make comments all the time. So 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 you know, sitting here and, and just telling Lots of great stories all the time. It's it's difficult with James because he 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 really managed to. I think James would be would be much easier for James to sit here and talk about the rest of us, because he has been listening a lot more than he has been 
talking. The time when I liked James the best and the time when James and I had the best time together, I believe, was when we were just the two of us together. The two or three of us. And, and at some point um, we started to play cards. We made a, we got a, some cheese boxes, you know, with the triangle cheese thing and, and, and we, we saved a lot of them and and uh, there were some people who we borrowed a scissor to cut our hair and then we just cut these so we made small cards and like in this size um, and painted them and so we could sit and I don't know we have like three four decks of cards so we could sit in the corner and play cards so me and me and James and a couple of other guys was just sitting in the corner and playing cards all day, you know, just sitting and was teaching each other different card games. And while we were sitting and playing cards, we, we just we could just speak about whatever quietly. If we spoke at all. But my best my best memories with James was really the he was really good at, at killing time in a very in a very calm way, without we have to speak about you know, world domination or something important. We could just sit there and chit chat and 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 be 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 present in a very quiet way. And and that was that was for me very very important with him. Very important and very very nice. I I remember I remember one time when I when I saw James react. And that was a time when there was somebody that was about to be released. And um, and we knew that the day will come that these guys would be released, you know. And, and we had, we were told by our guards and the one who was the ones that was negotiating for us that when we come out, don't speak to the media. Don't say anything because that will be used against the ones sitting back. And they killed a Russian guy called Sergei. And the excuse for killing him was to prove a point saying we killed him because one of the guy who was released spoke to the media. So they threatened us a lot saying don't speak to the media. And before these guys was released we had a conversation where James was asking the question, when you guys go out, will you speak to the media, the whatever? And and um, and the guy said, was one of the guys said, no, 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 no. Oh, the, uh, he couldn't promise, you know, because he's whatever. And James, he just continued, can you please promise not to say anything? And and. And that was one of the few times I really saw James react in a strong way was it was important for James to make sure when people when when these guys got out that they wouldn't speak to the media at all uh, because he didn't want to sit back and get the punishment for whatever fame or whatever happened people got released and and I remember, I remember that strongly because he, he really, he really reacted on that one. Uh, he really reacted on that one. Um, and everything else, he was just, you know, it's not important for me. But that thing was was very important for him. Did you know where you were in Syria? You know, did it? Was it scary because you didn't know where you were going next? When we were moved from from one prison to another, it was it was always very it was always scary because you, we didn't know if what would happen. You know, the first times we were moved, it was always very much it was very scary because what are they going to kill us? Are they going to release us? What happened? And then, the more time you're moved, the the more calm you get because you know, okay, we just have to move prison again. You know, just safety or 
the front line moved or whatever. You know, there can be many, many reasons why they are moving us. But always, you know, it was it was blindfold on the front of our eyes and handcuffs, um, even on the back. Uh, that depended a little bit on who moved us. You know, it was it was not the same guys all the time. You know, it was it's a big group, so many people was 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 helping with that with that part. But some of the moves took you know, 20 minutes, another move, there was one move who took like four or five days to be moved from. And we, 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 had, we had an idea where we were most of the time. Uh, I had the idea that we were in, like in the beginning we were around Aleppo. And uh, after the big trip, the four or five days, we knew that we were around Raqqa. Uh, the province of Raqqa, where we exactly were. Other people may know that, uh, but I'm not. You know, I have I have an idea of of where we were, and most of the time we knew what's what's what happening because a lot of people had a very good understanding of the strongholds of ISIS before they got caught. Uh, Jim and and I was taking, you know, earlier on. So when I guess when James was taken, there was no such thing in ISIS. And uh, but some people was got was taken very late in the process, and they knew that how everything could could involve or how the situation could could end up, and Raqqa could be a place that we would end up because that's. The safest place, basically, to to hold us. Um, but um, but <laughs> James, as I, as I said before, uh, James James was had been inside for a long time. You know, he had been a prisoner for a long time, longer than the most of us, and he knew all the tricks in the book. Let's say it like that. So when we were moved. From, from from Aleppo to Raqqa, we were put into some prisons to, on the way, you know. First we were in a big truck, and then we were put into another prison where there was some things laying on the ground. And, and I remember <laughs> at some point I asked James, uh, James, no, James, I think James came over to me and he said, Daniel, are you okay? Are you, are, do, are you cold? And I said, yeah, a little bit. I just had my orange jumpsuit on. and. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit cold. Okay, no problem. I I have an extra shirt for you here. And then he took off his his shirt thing, um, and um, uh, I think he had like three, four layers of clothes on him. And he just gave me like two of those layers. You know, I just collected. You know, the last few days. You know, he just took everything that he could get his hand on because you never know when to use it. You know, he. He had really tried to be cold or to need something. And myself, I didn't want to risk anything. I didn't want to to do anything. So so James he, he came over to me and gave me some extra some extra clothes to make sure that, that I, I was not freezing. Um, and and another time we were given a lot of dates to eat. And uh, at some point we just had to, we were moved and, you know, food is very, very valuable for us. So you just don't leave food behind or destroy it or whatever. But sometimes you have to do it because there's no way to put it. And I remember one day we, we came in, we were moved to one prison to another and all of us was like, fuck, we lost all this, this food, man. It was great the other place. And then James, he just took out his pen. And he took up like two kilos of dates. You know, don't worry, guys. I still, I still, uh, I took a little bit. So we have walked around with like two kilos of dates inside his, inside his his pants for like four or five hours or something like this. Before we came to this place, yeah. Here you go, guys. You know, and so he really managed to, to 
you know he really managed to you know he could he could have have taken all the food by himself later that night or whatever but he he always he always took the thing so he could he could share it around or give it to the people who who who, who didn't have it and um and that was that, that's kind of a deal in a place where you have nothing you know it's difficult to give it's very easy to to take um and that was also one of the reasons why I think that I managed to survive all this with with my mind pretty much okay. It was because I I was able to give away my 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 gymnastic uh, skills. You know, I could teach other people gymnastics and healthy workouts, etc. That was my gift to the group where Stephen had a lot of history, James had literature, history, Spanish, whatever, you know, we all, all of us had different things to put inside, uh, inside uh, the, the pot into the group, um, so we had something to, to kill the time with, so th- I think that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we felt that we were okay. I I when I was in on the national team in Denmark in gymnastics, we, we were a small group that was training together every day. We ate together, we slept together, we we cried together, we laughed together, we traveled together, everything we did together. So we, we had us like our small family, you know, and basically the rest of the world was non existing because we just wanted to be world champion or whatever in gymnastics. And in many ways the same thing happened in Syria uh, with all the, the other guys because instead of thinking that we are away from the group or we are caught up, you know, we started to have our, our own small world um, in there. Uh, we had our own routine, we had our own uh, rituals, we have... Uh, uh, our own humor, our unwritten rules, you know, these things you do, these things you doesn't. And, and um, so, so our, our world became, you know, the big, big, big world were for us just the small room, but it was still a world, it was still our society, it was still our rules. Um, and, um, and I think that made that made everything much easier to survive in a way. It was much easier to understand. You know, we didn't have to think about economy. We didn't have to think about bank loans or car, like it, the prices of gas at the moment uh, or whatever. Our schedule today or I'm a schedule free. Yeah, it, it's it's okay. I, I don't have anything to do. You know, it was. We always joked in between each other, you know. Oh, do you have an appointment later today? Uh, no, I'm 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 off. Okay, do you want to talk? Yeah, okay, I can. See. Yeah, we can talk later, you know. So, so we we had our old our small society in there, and everybody was good at different things, and we contributed with different things, and so the big world with seven billion people just was turned into a small world with 15 guys or 19 or who, how many we were uh, with up and downs and funny moments and sad moments and etc so so that that was basically how how it was and if you look at it with like when you look back on it that's what i remember was our small society where we really start to know each other. You know who made this fart. You could smell this is the fart of you. You know who, well, just when people are walking in the night, you could hear who was walking. You know, all the time, we, we, you know, we knew each other very, very well, what to expect, what not to expect. Um, did you, um, how did you perceive time? Like, did you, were you able to keep track of time? Um, as far as like like calendar, like did you? Like yeah, some, some of us uh, was 
was very much into the calendar thing. You know, it was very important for them to know the dates and stuff. So uh, we were some some of us was very good at at keeping up with time. And then sometimes we made these proof of life pictures where you have to hold a piece of uh, paper in front of you where there was a date written, and then you could see that date and you know, okay, the 24th today. Well, okay, we thought it was 22nd, so, but it's 24th, so we were like okay with the dates. Uh, and it was important for for some of us to know when we were remo removed from one prison to another. And okay, remember, okay, we were we were three weeks at that place, and we were two weeks at that place, that means there was five weeks, and then including one and a half month, and then suddenly we had a timeline, and we also always have places to go back to, and people have their birthdays sometimes, etc., etc. So somehow it was quite easy to get hold of the time. If I was by myself, I would never be able to do it, but because we were so many people and everybody had something to look forward to, you know. So were you able to celebrate birthdays and holidays? Mm -hmm. able to, yeah, able like, to do that? yeah, yeah, we did. We, we managed to, to celebrate some holidays and birthdays together. I remember James's 40 year old birthday, you know, it was late at night, it was completely dark. I don't remember if we did the massage that day uh, anyway, but James just, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I turned 40 today. I'm just like, what? Yeah, and we just, he just whispered that into you know, the room. And, and was like, oh, we have to, uh, we have to sing and we have to do everything. And oh, no, it's okay, it's okay. So we sang, sang a song for him. And, and uh, I remember that we said, like, we hope it will begin a much better birthday next year. So, uh, but we, what, what we celebrated and, and what I really enjoyed celebrating was, was, um, was uh, Christmas. Christmas was for me a very very important uh, time. Um, at that at that point, we were split up in two rooms. Uh, so I was sitting with I was sitting with with Stephen and and John and James and Pierre and a few other guys, and um, and we didn't have anything to we didn't have any present to give each other. We didn't have didn't have any gifts. Um, so we we decided to sit down and uh, in a circle. And then we had to say something nice to each other. So I uh, so um, I don't rem I don't remember who started but one of us started and then as you say something to Steve and then as you say something about James and I say something about John etc. And um, we really, really took our time. I think we said eight guys together. And uh, it started like, first time I met you kind of thing. And my first impression, and this is my impression now. And, and it was a really nice time, especially because we, at, before that we, we used to be like 13 guys together and suddenly we're only eight. Oh, it was like, whew, was much more space for us to, to be in. Uh, and um, and I remember that I, I said to I said to James that the first time I met you was in this toilet, you know, in this prison, and and you looked as confused as if you were just dumped down on the earth from the moon or something, you know. You looked like yeah, you looked a bit crazy and and. You basically destroyed my whole idea of this great war journalist, James Wright Foley. Um, and, uh, and this picture of this perfect guy, you know, who, who in control of the story and et cetera, et cetera. And, and then suddenly I find out that you are very clumsy. You're very bad at sports. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Etc. And but but then again, you you're the most. I think I said to him, you know, 
You're the most honest person. There is no evil at all to find in you, James. You are pure good, sometimes too good. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy that I've that I've met you, and um, I really like being with you, um, even though these circumstances. So, um, so I think that was what I said to to James. That's that Christmas. Uh, that's Christmas night. Um, Said to you. Yeah, I think James he said to me that the first time he saw me, he just saw a small, scared guy. You know, I had this military uniform on, and he just saw this small mouth, ooh, so weak and and scared. And then uh, suddenly, I turned out to be this. Yeah, I, I. What do you call it? I developed into, I, I regrained my strength and started to teach gymnastics and I started to, to take control of something. And that his first impression was very, very weak of me. And then in the end, he, he, he really respected me for, for who I was and what I did. And I had a good heart. I remember he, said, he told me. So. So that was that was an incredible Christmas night, you know, getting, you know, anybody can come over to you and say something to you, but you don't really give a shit because they, you know, you don't know, you don't, the person don't really know you, you know, but when you have been sitting inside with people like this for such a long time and they know you that well and you have been going through all of these insane situations, when people tell their, tell you that we like you, or if you say to somebody else, "I really, I really like you," or "I really respect you," or "You are a good person," then then it means that that really means something for you know that's that's not just empty air talk bullshit. It's it's worth something. And sitting there in the corner, eight guys, and and basically telling. Be very honest towards each other. Was very strong, and and very 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 beautiful as well, you know, because people was very good, and it was very honest. There was nothing to. There's nobody who didn't have anything nice to say to each other. Something was better than other things, but people knew it in some way. But the fact that people was actually being good to each other was was there was. An amazing night, an amazing night. I was really, when I went to bed that night, I really felt that I had the best Christmas night in, in, in my life, basically. It was, so everything was not uh, sadness and torture and shit and whatever, you know. A lot of this was always also like very extreme. Like, as we said, everything is extreme. Like John, John used to say in the prison, you know, everything is extreme. When you're happy, you're extremely happy. When you're sad, you're extremely sad. When every, when you get good food, you get like when you get a lot of food, you get extremely. And when you get no food, everything is extreme. Everything goes to the extremes in here. So when and that's also interesting because usually. It's easy to live your life in like autopilot on the outside, you know, you just do what's safe and but in there you 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 get you really see the extremes everywhere. So when you get feeling of, of being good to each other, you're getting you're being extremely good to each other. And uh, and that's uh, that's really really something. Really really something. Something you will never manage to to experience anywhere else than in a place like that. So um, that was our Christmas night. So I think Daniel was the one who came up with Secret Santa. Was that something that you also did? Yeah, I um, I used to work as a, also as a gymnastic teacher at a school in Denmark. Um, and, uh, and, and the principal for that school, he used to have this thing every winter with all the kids. 
Well, they have to be like secret Santa towards each other. So he will find people who didn't speak that much to each other normally. And then they have to to play secret Santa uh, towards each other. And um, which meant that, that during that time, people would probably maybe know each other a bit better because you have to look at them and give them a small gift or, you know, play them a trick or something. And um, and I was thinking that, you know, it's difficult for us to to play, and to, you know, it's difficult for us to to um, to celebrate Christmas in any way, you know, from the 1st of December to the 24th, it's difficult to do whatever. So I thought of that maybe we should do the Secret Santa things. And most of them was like into it, yeah, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Um, and some wasn't, but... Uh, uh, John, John, he he wasn't a part of it. He didn't want to do it because, yeah, he was was. They had a small discussion between this Muslim and mm. Christian thing and celebrating Christmas. If you're Muslim, that's not right, etc. But so John, he um, he decided to um, to uh, to to put us together. So he basically said that everybody who was very who didn't speak that much to each other should be, yeah, connected in some way. Either you were Santa for them or they were for you. Uh, so most of most of Christmas we we were secret Santa for each other and and we we couldn't give food to each other really. It was difficult to give away food um, because we didn't get that much at all. Um, but but we could. We could give each other you know, love in a way, and so just just the fact that people will go and talk to you know I had to talk to you, I have to go and be nice to you because I'm your secret Santa. You know, it wouldn't be nice if you come the twenty fifth and why be, why why were you such a dick if you were my Santa kind of thing. So people really made an effort to be kind to each other and to to be nice to each other and to speak to those who whom they didn't used to speak to and because they were their Santa thing and and I was uh, I was uh, Santa for uh, for Stephen uh, Sadlov and uh, so I um, every night I I started speaking much more with him before that I, we were not that good friends but during that during December we really started to get along very well and and every night he asked me to tuck him in so I had to put like the the thing around him. It was during winter, so it was really cold, and uh, and it was very clear that it affected the whole group because when somebody is nice to you, you become happy and you become nice to them. So it's it's just affected everybody, and and we really, really, really had a wonderful Christmas. So you know, for me, I, it was an excellent idea. It really, really worked out very well, even though we took it from like a, a boarding school and idea in Denmark, uh, but everybody was really into it and 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 did the, the best that they they could. You guys were able to play Risk. Mm. You know, risk, where that was a big. That was a big thing. What yeah. to do in the? Yeah. Were you involved with the, uh, the construction of the board? Or the, yeah. Did you play? No, I. I think I I started to ask some of the guys if if we should try if they were up to it because it 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 took a lot of time and materials to build this and and people was like yeah it's good I did we had a, a white piece of of cardboard uh, like box um, so we folded out so we have a big piece of white board that could be our the, the plate and then we started to I started to collect dates and seeds like uh, dates and and uh, date seeds and and olive seeds um, and there were different sizes different colors etc etc so they could be like small pawns in, in this risk game and and we had a pen like one pen and we decided that we could use this so one of the guys he drew a map of the world and uh, Stephen and I, we, we like made all the 
different countries and we started to, we ripped a lot of paper into pieces and to write, you know, missions and countries, etc., etc. So yeah, we managed after, I don't know, three weeks, one month or so to make this risk game. And the way to use the, the biggest, the diff most difficult thing was actually to the dice thing, because um, how to do that, we couldn't, I tried to take a date and make it like uh, into a... Like a date pit or something? And yeah, I, I, like I took a date seat and I just started to cross it on the floor and I hoped that I could get it shaped like a die. Uh, but it didn't work. And then in the end, um, we came up with, we took a, we had a small bucket that we received some yogurt in. And uh, we took a small nail and we cut out a piece of cardboard and we put it in the bottom of the, of the, um, of the bucket and we made like three lines. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you should hold up um, um, a date seat and let it go, let it fall down and whatever it landed on, it would be um, it would be um, it would be that number. So that was our dice for the game. Um, and yeah, it was really really fun to make to create this game. You know, that was for me that was the best part of it was was to create this thing, to manage the to, to manage to 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 feel that you are doing something you know you're creating something that was awesome mm -hmm. and then we started to play and you know take like 10 you know journalists war idiots and put them into one room and made them play the the, the game about taking control over the world you know that's it's basically like putting gasoline to a bonfire it's uh, it's a it's meant to go wrong and and of course it did you know none of us like to lose and so it, it ended up in a lot of like huge discussions and uh, but also some very very good games like it was it was really a good way to kill like I think I think we managed to play for like one or two weeks until we had to put it away and <laughs> it was like Jumanji, you know, it, it really created, it really destroyed people in a way, but it was, it was funny, but we didn't, we played a lot of different games. We also managed to make um, a chess and, and um, what do you call it? Um, chess and checkers. Um, we played a lot of chess, especially James was horrible at chess, like really, he tried to learn it, but it never, never happened, you know, it was... Was there, was there a routine for meals or was it just, you didn't know when food was coming, you didn't know what food you were going to get, like, was it just like a sporadic, always concerned about food coming or how, did, I mean, I'm sure it changed, it's not uh, easy to put a, put a... It's part of a complex conversation. Let's, let's say, like, I think, I think, as a rule, in general, in in prisons, like in prison in um, in Syria, like these Islamic uh, jails, like, in a, I think there is a rule in a, in a jail in in an Islamic state jail, Jabhat uh, al-Nusra jails. There's it's minimum two breads a day. And with something. So a normal day could be like breakfast around, I don't know, 12 or so. Would be one bread and one egg. And then when it's dinner, it could be, again, one bread. It's, this is this um, hobbies, it's called, uh, traditional Syrian bread. And then some, it could be like 10 or 15 olives with that bread so it really but it really changed a lot and sometimes we didn't get in breakfast 
but but I don't remember there was a day after my for first three weeks of Georgia thing. I don't remember there was a day when we didn't get anything to eat. Uh, we always managed to get a little bit every day. But I think it, we were supposed to have two meals a day. Or meals, that's that's a big word, but but um yeah, but it, it changed a lot. You know, sometimes we had a period where the food was very good when there were some good guards and they had a good kitchen very close to or whatever. And other times, you know, you could have a, a time where where there was there was a lot of fighting going on outside and it was difficult for them to to bring some food. Was there an intentional starvation period at the beginning? Of yeah, basically from from I was taken until the yeah mid of February. Mid February was the first time it started to get constantly okay. When we were moved to Raqqa, basically, when we were moved to Raqqa, it started to get okay because there was no fighting in the area, there was no, like, it, it was calm and and we were started to be negotiated out. So they wanted us to look healthy and okay. So they were ordered to give us great food. In the beginning, uh, before I was taken, or when they were in the box, uh, James and John, uh, what I know and what they told me was that they were really starved there. Like, what what they told me was that I think they was, like, they lost, there was about, James was about, I don't know, 55, 60 kilos or something when he was the skinniest. And the same with, the, with John was also at that level, they were really, really, really soft. But that was in the beginning with the box, basically with the Beatles also. Uh, and that was after they tried to escape and stuff. Um, so they were really, really mistreated, um, mm -hmm. food-wise, but also they were really punished. So that was a long period of time where it was really difficult for them. Um, and uh, they didn't like to talk about it. They didn't find it very interesting to talk about. When, when you asked them about it, they will mostly just be like, "Yeah, that, that's boring. You know, that's that's not interesting for us to talk about." Mm -hmm. But one thing I know was that that um, that they really, really, really had a, a difficult time. And the most amazing part of of them having a difficult time in the beginning was that you couldn't, it wasn't, you couldn't feel it when they came into the room that October, mid-October. They, they, you know, they managed to get back on track, to gain strength again. Um, so, but but you could feel that it was it was a part of James's thing, the part of starving. It was not it's not nice to starve, and it was it was it was a, an issue for James the the the, the food thing, uh, but it was also a big issue for me for myself. So I I completely understand why he had it like that. It's it's not very nice to be starved, but some people managed to to kind of forget it or they don't want to bother, you know. We don't getting anything, we're not getting anything, but you know, if it's about knocking on the door and then you will get something, you know, and then Jim didn't mind knock on the door. You know, even if they come a little bit punishment instead of food. But that's that's the risk. He was worth taking, uh, especially. Um, so there was no doubt that their their beginning, their first weeks, the first month of their captivity was was really, really difficult. Um, and um, but it it became much better when when they were moved to the same jails as us. Yeah, I got, I've got the impression that from what I'm what I'm kind of starting to realize is that before John and Jim you guys got together that year almost a year mm -hmm. before you guys joined. It was a very different 
almost mm-hmm. life, a different experience for those guys. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and getting, coming into the cell with you guys in mm-hmm. the group was, a, was kind of a new chapter. Um, I think it was, it must have been the middle of June or something like that, when, when uh, James and John and, and, and the two other guys who was held at the box, they were put, they were put to the same jail as, as the rest of us were in. The one we call the Children's Hospital or the Eye Hospital or whatever it have. We also call it community prison. It has a lot of names. It depends on where you are. But when when they were moved, like James and John was held separately because they were Muslims, but they were still treated. They were treated much, I think, better than, than us in that prison because they were Muslims. Uh, so they gained a lot of strength and looked really well when they were put together with us. Uh, so I believe for for James and John the the really difficult part was the first like yeah half year half year was 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 definitely the worst part for them. Uh, I was wanted to see if we could fill in some of the blanks about the um, the captors. I guess specifically the Beatles, because it seems like they were the most, um, the most present amongst everything, everybody. Um, yeah, but I think especially for James and John, they were the most present ones, mm. uh, because I, first time I saw the Beatles was was actually pretty late in the process. It was around September. I guess that was the first time I saw them, and then we only saw them a few times, like not that much. Um, so they were not our everyday uh, guards, like like in the beginning of James and Johnson's captivity, the Beatles was their their everyday guards. Um, So there's no doubt that the Beatles, for James and John, the Beatles means very, very different different things from from for me, for example, for instance. You know, they were hard from to me. Like they were very, they were very tough towards me also and the rest of the guys. But no matter what, they meant freedom for me because they were the one negotiating with me. But uh, James and John were destroyed by the Beatles in the beginning. And um, and then they came back and they were not the, they were not, they were not any, they, they were not any sign of, of, of freedom for them. Uh, so what the Beatles is for them and what it is for me is, is very different things, I guess. Um, so it's difficult to explain, but one thing is sure that they are very, very, they, were, they really managed to be very scary. They were, they were very scary, the way that they did, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they were really, really good at it, at what they did. They really good at being scary and being, being tough. And uh, So it's, it's, it's difficult for me to say much about them, actually, because I don't know them that well. I don't, I haven't spoken to them, I haven't, you know. I try to be as, as far away, as, as small as possible when they came in. Um, when you were with uh, the guards, how did you interact with them and what were some of the interactions and did they, did they have mind games and it was like, it, like the way, best way I can t- say it is that it, it was like there was always a good cup and a bad cup in their guts, you know. If 
there will always be a good guy you could ask for anything, you know. Maybe he didn't bring it to us, but we could always ask him, can we get two buses? Can we get an end clipper? Can we get a bit more food? Can we get two more breads? Can we, you name whatever. Can you take us an extra time to the bathroom? But there will always be a guard. You will never ask these kind of things. You will just, uh, you will just say thank you if he give you any food, or you will just like keep it very short whenever you you are talking with him. I don't know if, I don't know if if that was the meaning or the plan of of everything, but some way I think that they that were they are their attack tactics towards us so we you know if it's pure evil if there's only evil eh, you know it would be difficult for us to to accept the situation and we'll probably try, try to make suicide or whatever but if there are if there's always a, a good guy who came comes in and and clap you on the shoulder you know everything will be all right it gives you hope and then another guy comes in and beat you up and you know so there was always a good and a bad cop uh, in the prison. And um, I think that's the easiest way to say it. So some of them, they, they were really, really good guys. And, and they really, you know, it's, they, I don't know, but of course all of them was, um, was, was bad guys who, who probably wanted to kill us right away if, if they were told to. So. But there was always, always some of them who, who acted a little nice towards us. So that's the, I think that's the easiest way to, to tell it, or the, the best way to tell it. What does a stress position... Was, there, was, there, was one of the punishments to put someone in a stress position? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it, it could be, yeah. But a stress position can be a lot of things. A stress position can be to stand up for three days. A stress position can be standing like with bended legs and arms over your head. Um, I um, I only I only try st stress position in the beginning of my captivity when I was tortured, anyways, and and then in the beginning as well, in the, in the end, in the very end. Uh, when it was only me and and the other guys left, um, so yeah, there was there was stress positions. There was, um, but uh, there's there's different levels of stress positions. As far as Jim experiencing any of these things, if he was, did he ever was he ever punished with like a stress position? Do you remember? Or or if it wasn't Jim, was it done in the in the public or in the room mm -hmm. everyone. The one time I I there was something was um, when we were together all of us, we just came to Raqqa. And the first time the Beatles really started to 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 work with us again and, and, and James was asked to stand up for a whole night in the middle of the room. Uh, while all the rest of us could sleep, and the day after it was it was Peter who was told to stand up all night. Um, so yeah, the, he was punished with the with stress position, but you know, it's um, but there was not much of it. It was just when the Beatles came and they just had to show us who they were and give us a reminder of who they were and what they were capable of. So it was, but in the beginning and as far as, as, as James John and John told us and told me, there was a lot of stress position in the beginning of their captivity when they also got starved and... You know, we've heard this term, uh mock executions which is being kind of thrown around now mm, yeah and, and, and it's a nice it's a nice word mock, mock, mock execution is a nice word but you know like 
you can laugh about it. I have been mock, mock executed a few times since I knew that they were not doing it. I knew that they wouldn't come in and just shoot me and then walk away again. If they wanted to kill me, they would do it in front of the camera or whatever, you know. So these mock executions, they it sounds terrible, but I can only speak for myself, but, but of course maybe somebody was very afraid, afraid that they're going to are they really going to kill me now? But but mostly and I know for, for James and John they knew that they knew that whatever happened they will just they would be they would know when when it turned when it when they knew when when it would happen. And was it, would a mock execution be like guns and swords or yeah, I remember one time. I, I, I never remember James was mug, mug executed, but uh, I remember John was once, and they just came in and they took this big sword and to hold it to his head, and and then um, yeah, and then they just walked away, laughed, laughing, kind of. That was just not. That was not the Beatles. That was somebody else. Maybe it was. I, I don't know. Uh, but but all. All of us like, yeah. They just had to. They just wanted to play a game with us, you know, whatever. Were you aware of times when you were in, in captivity, what was happening to the Syrian prisoners? It was very, um, it was very generally that they were hanged by their wrists. Like they did, the, the guards will take their hands, like take some string around the hands, and they'll just like pull them up so the hand like this on the back, and they would be hang up like this, um, and um, and I know they used that a lot because all of them had pains around the the wrists whenever whenever I was in the same room as them. And then they was wiped with a piece of like a thick cable, and um, yeah. Some of them was also witnessing uh, some stress positions. And Were they killing the Syrians? Not that I was aware of. Not not in front of us. Not not around us. Uh, maybe maybe of course they were, but that would be outside. But that was in the beginning. That was that was at the children's hospital. That was not in the end kind of thing when everything got much more organized and we were so many westerners together this was in the beginning where there was only a few of us at this prison what did you know about jim's faith and what did you see him go through and and his relationship with god and could you kind of give us your give us your take on on jim jimmy's faith while he was while he was there um, yeah when when i saw james the first time uh, I saw him as a as a Muslim. James converted converted in the beginning of his captivity. Him and Jim and John converted together, and I know that was at the same period as they was getting really bad treatment. Was that a result? Do you think of it? Uh, was it a survival tactic? Or? I think that at that moment, the way that they told me was that the time was so difficult to it was so difficult to get through the everyday that they asked the guards to start giving them some lessons in Islam and the guards gave them lessons in Islam and also gave them gave, gave them some tools to to deal with this with this hard treatment way to to pray and way to to seek answers in a way. So suddenly they had something to hold on to during this this very very difficult time, and and um, and it didn't really like they were told many times that this this will not affect you. This will not help you. Uh, this will not change our way of treating you guys. You know, don't do it to help us do it because you believe in it. And, and they uh, they decided to 
to convert and uh, and they they really meant it. Uh, I I knew that you know they 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 really they really meant what they were doing. There was not only like even though they were asked not to pray, they prayed anyways. Like just very silent by themselves in the corner. Um, but uh, I believe for, for John was not that religious before, but James he comes from a very religious family. So what James used to say to me was that for him God is the same, and the faith is the same. It's just another way of of worshiping, and it's another way of 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 using your faith. It's, Especially, you know, normally we have a tradition of going into church every Sunday, but if you cannot do that, you need another way of feeling that you are you are using your using your or you're doing something with your with your faith or you're praying for something and 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 Islam was a very good way for for them to feel that they could they could actually pray and they could say something. They gave a good routine, and there was many things that that was very that was very convenient and very very good for them to to hold on to and you know um, so in my opinion i I never really thought about it I never really cared about whatever they converted to Islam or not because it's you know it's in a situation like this you know there's there's no right and wrong there's no reasons there's no it's difficult it's very very easy to sit back home here and and say that oh he's not a real Christian or he's a traitor what the fuck people can say but when you are sitting in a situation where you are being punished like to a level that you cannot believe how much you can get punished and and how much pain you can witness you know and this is the only way this is the only thing you can hold on and grab on to you know then uh, then it's a completely other story so I, I respected them for for what they for what they choose to do, and uh, and I backed them up one hundred percent. And I was not I was not I didn't doubt any second that they they meant what they did. Uh, they had to they had to mean it. Um, so for me, that's basically a very it's not an interesting subject in a way because that's a, that's a personal choice and a, and you can call it a surviving skills you can call it a just way of being you know interested in another culture you can you can say that they really mean i don't know but you know yeah. religion is a strange thing and that's what caught off all of us into this mess so i i don't know and that was their choice, and uh, and they never regretted. What were your feelings like when you saw people starting to leave? When we started to see people leave, it 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 was it was it was the first one, the first who was released it was very nice, and all of us was very happy. Because we we knew that then there was a way out. It was possible. It meant that there was like we were always afraid that the swap or the there was something that that couldn't that was not possible, you know. But we knew there was a there was a there was a line, you know. There was an, an, a line of negotiation, and there was a way of of switching money and and, and person. Same time, etc., etc. So, it it makes us very happy. But but then again, it was really difficult uh, when 
when people started to leave because the group got smaller and smaller and you started to ask yourself uh, like somebody forgotten me or what's going on with my case uh, you know uh, and 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 especially for for me and and, and the other the Brits and Americans the, we started to we started to see that you know the group got smaller and smaller and smaller and every time the be the Beatles came in they asked me you know or that they told me that my family couldn't find money enough so they they threatened me a lot with those kind of things so I was but I knew that was that was a negotiation going on for me, and and that was that was very different to the Brits and Americans because there was no negotiation. And I remember they they spoke a lot in between each other, like, well, what's what's up with our case? You know, they tried to look for any signs of any good signs, any signs of negotiation thing, maybe. They had a theory that maybe they want all the Europeans gone first, and then they will start with the Brits and Americans just to keep them separated. That was one of the the speculation that that, that went on, uh, and uh, and also um, they um, like every time they they came in and they said something to us, they said something about something, you know, everything was was listened to and turned in every different direction, you know, can can this mean this, can this mean that, you know, can this affect our situation in any way. Um, but all of us, and, and we tried to be as positive as possible, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, they just want all the Europeans gone and then they will start the negotiating for Brits and American because they have never said that they wouldn't. Kind of, even though that they had said it a few times and that was in the card already, but they were really scared. The Brits, the Brits and Americans, was really scared that that was the like what they were most scared about was that it was about prisoners. The swap was about prisoners, and I believe that what was it was it was about prisoners, and America doesn't. Negotiate neither do Brit Britain, so there was no there was no chance that they want to swap any prisoners for for these guys, and that was that was really really yeah sad, you know they didn't even get a chance to to negotiate in any way, you know the family didn't get a chance to do anything. As far as I, I'm informed. Do you remember when Jim had got his proof of life questions? What was it like to get to to know that proof of life questions were being asked of you? In the beginning of December, yeah, I think, uh, and John and James always knew that they were different somehow um, because of their treatment in the beginning. You know, they always knew that there was something going on that was not right. You know, they were not negotiated for like the the friends or me or whatever. Uh, so when when uh, I I believe it, John was the first like first uh, Beatles came in and and asked for emails and informations about for everybody you know, both Brits and Americans and and the Europeans. So. We knew that at that point, all of us was hoping that we were on the same track, that we are on the same, some, like we had the same destiny. Um, and uh, then I think they came in with the proof of life for, for John. And of course, John was happy because he, he had uh, some questions back from, from his, his loved ones. But, but he was not really happy, you know, he was not. He didn't show it. He was just like, okay, fine. And then everybody else got the proof of lies. Like, and everybody came in like, yes, I'm happy. And 
so on. And um, but James didn't get his proof of life. Like he was like, well, why don't they come? Blah, blah, blah. Until one day that they came in, like in the end, when everybody else got their proof of life questions, they came in and and they asked James to to follow, to come with them. But he got his proof of life question. When he came back, he was just. He said that this was the best day of his life, you know, he came with his arms over his head and not only James, but all of us knew that it would probably be a proof of life question that he, that, that, that they will, that they will ask him for when he was taken out. So when he came back and he confirmed that that was what he was, what, what, why they would uh, talk to him and then him and John, they, they hugged each other and they were dancing around like, like they just won the big lottery, you know. They were really, really, really happy. But that was, that was, that was the, the last time they, they had any sort of, that was the first and last time they had any sort of communication thing, uh, as far as I know. Mm. So there, were, there was no doubt they were on a different mm. track. And then, um, I remember when, um, like, I I knew when I got my last proof of life. I told Pierre to tell my parents if if this is the last proof of life, if if this is the proof of life that means that I'm on my way out, it should be about my old green car. So I received the 11th of June. I received a, a proof of life from the Beatles asking me who bought your old car, which meant that it was about my old green car and which also meant that I was on my way out. So the 11th of June, I, did, I knew that, that I was on my way out. And first I got really happy uh, for like, when I heard it, but, but then the happiness just vanished right away because I kind of, there were so many emotions that, that did that I couldn't really feel happy because one thing it could be, it could be bullshit. It could be the Beatles who interrogated and tortured Pierre to tell them what I asked him to say and now they're just playing with my brain or my my head or whatever or um, it could be um, um, or also the fact that the rest of the guys in the prison didn't have any like they didn't have any negotiation going on so the fact that that I was on my way out and I was leaving them was very, very, very strange because, you know, we have done so many things together. We had arm wrestling competition, trivias, eating, shitting, you know, we've done any, everything together and suddenly leaving this thing seemed so... so far away, you know. Um, but right away when when the Beatles walked out the door, you know, James and, and John, David, you name it, the guys came over to me and, and gave me a hug and, oh, it's great and fair, congratulations, etc., etc. But I remember when I did that towards the other guys, you know, I was happy for them, but I was still sad myself for the fact that it was not me, you know, because in the end you want it to be you who get this message so you can go home to your family and loved ones. Um, but they didn't have any negotiation, anything, and but they they came over to me anyways. Oh, then congratulations and gave me a hug and and. Um, 
and that was that was strange because I was like, stop, 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 don't like, don't say that, you know. And then, and then the Daniel, they said, Daniel, don't don't worry, you know, you have done your time, you can, you deserve, you deserve to go home, you know, you, you have done your time, and it's just. Yeah, that's that's really that's really the most weird feelings I've ever had in my in my body, you know. Um, but I got this proof of life, and I knew that I was going home within I don't know a week. Everything between two days and one week was what the other guys waited. So I. Yeah, basically started waiting. I knew they will come in the morning to pick me up if they will come. And and then um, one day went, two days went. I already, I said goodbye to all of them like the first day. You know, this is the goodbye. And now we don't know when they're coming, but now we said goodbye for real. Because the other times we never said goodbye yet. People just got picked up and was like, wait, where are they going? So we, we said goodbye like first day or second day or something like that. But then fourth day, fifth day, shit man. And then I woke up the, the sixth day in the morning and I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep all night because I was so afraid of what if, what if they're play, playing a trick on me? What, is, what if what I thought was my release was just made up? And I was sitting there in the corner really, really scared. and like sitting and I couldn't sit still. I was just destroying my own myself with thoughts and whatever. And James, he, James, he, he, he noticed that I was that I was awake. So he he was sleeping in, in the other corner of the room together with Stephen and, and and Peter, while I was sleeping with with John and Tony in the other corner of the room. And, um, and James, he walked over to me and he, he sat down right next to me and and, I, and he said, are you okay, Daniel? I said, yeah, yeah. And then I just couldn't hold it back and I said, fuck, fuck man. I am really, really scared. I'm, I'm really, 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 really scared right now. I don't know what to do, what to think. I, I, don't, I don't believe. And he said, Daniel, calm down. Calm down. Everything will be worked. Will, will be fine, you know, you are going home, they will come in a few hours or tomorrow, but one thing is sure, then you will go home. I was like, but fuck, I'm so scared, and he was like, don't, don't be scared, everything will be fine, you'll be back home with your family in, in, uh, in a short, short time, and I was like, it's such, once again, it was a weird feeling because I was sitting there crying and making a scene in front of James and I was about to go home. And James, he didn't have anything to look forward to. And then I, and then he was the one, you know, laying his arm around my shoulders and cheering me up. It should be the other way around. But I just, I just couldn't hold it anymore. And, and we, we spoke a little bit about you know, whatever, just to think about something else. And um, James, at that moment, it was very important that we were in, at our own places because if they could just come in like this and we had to be close to our beds, ready to jump on the walls if they came in, or else we would got beaten up. So. James, he went to back to his his side of the room, back to his bed, and I sat back. And ten minutes after, they knocked on the door. They came in and and uh, yeah, and asked me to put a blanket over my head and follow them. And I was on my on my way home. That was the last time I 
was the last time I um I saw um I saw James and the other guys. And I uh, I remember I remember one of the most scary thing ever was that right before I left one of the Beatles tapped me on my shoulder and said Daniel look and he pointed towards David or he pointed towards one of the guys and I looked there and he was just sitting with his arm over his head and his hands were shaking like this of just pure fear and then um, yeah Yeah, and I, I left. I left them. So, but, you know, I, I couldn't do anything about it. I have, I tried to give everything that I could give to them according to, you know, I taught them everything I could about keeping themselves strong in a physical way. Uh, by teaching them gymnastics and that was that was my gift to them so I felt that when I left I I kind of left something of me that they could use and that has been a big big thing for me to a, a, a very important thing for me to to when I when I tell myself Daniel you cannot do anything about it don't don't uh, don't punish yourself mentally by thinking that you left them or something. The fact that I can tell myself that I actually left something with them is is very important for my mental way of 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 getting on with this with my life after all this. Federico got released. Um, two or three weeks before me and they came in one day and, and got him and, and he just was out the door which was also very that was a very also a very scary time you know the group couldn't be much smaller than it was and we were sitting there back and thinking when is our turn to to leave, is there any more that is leaving, or was he the last one? We didn't know that at that time. And um, and up until up until Federico, he 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 left. We were treated very well. When the Beatles came, they they tend to to rough us up a bit and give us some. Yeah, gave us a hard time, but there was only a small period of time, and there was only every once a week or twice, like every 14 days or something. So it was, it was okay, you know. But then when Federico left, they came back the day after. And they... Uh, they beat the shit out of uh, James and I. Like... Um, I think it's called a Charlie horse when you put your knee into the legs of a person and they did that to to me and James why we had to say, sit in stress position, you know, with bended legs arm over our heads. I don't know how many they gave us but it just continued and it was it never tried anything that hurt so much in my entire life. And it just continued. I was I laid down crying, stand up in stand up again, they kicked again, and uh, they did that to me and James, and the rest of the guys, they really didn't touch that much, so it's, it's, and it was strange because they've been treating us okay, yeah, of course they've been roughing us up, but this was like really damaging, like really damaging, and it could really damage our legs, like for, for life. And then they they just left, and I was just laying back, you know. Maybe I had 
20 Charlie horses on each leg. And I could, I was just laying, I couldn't be in my own body of pure pain. And I knew that James got exactly the same uh, treatment in the other corner of the room. And I, and I was just laying there crying and didn't know what to do. I couldn't lay anywhere, I couldn't, it's just, it hurt so much. So John and David, I think, came over to me and started trying to to make it better and and James in the other corner of the room he I knew he got exactly the same treatment as me but I couldn't hear it like he didn't he didn't scream as much as I did he didn't make the same noises as I, as I, as I did he just he just um, I don't know if he kept it inside or how he did it, but only a few minutes after they left, he, James, he kind of looked up and asked me if I was okay. And at that time, I was still crying. I was like, shut up, James. I, I remember I said, shut up, James, you know. You know <laughs> don't ask me if I'm okay, you know. Don't, don't worry about me, don't, don't worry about yourself. I'm, 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 I'm fine. No, you're not, James. You, your, your legs are, are very bad right now. And um, and one of the other guards came in and asked us if we want to go to the toilet or if we, because he had heard all the things. So he just made sure that sometimes when you get beaten up so badly, you you can you shit your pants or something. So he just wanted to make sure if anyone of us needed to go to the toilet and. And neither James or I could go to the toilet at that time. We couldn't walk. Um, but yeah, we just laid there for like a few hours until the pain started to disappear a bit. Uh, and I think for two or three days we couldn't really walk properly. And then two after the, it was this. There was this was the second of June. This one when this happened, and then two or three days after they came in again, and they started with me a little bit with both legs, and I told them, that, guys, if you continue, you I, you will completely destroy my legs. You know, my muscles will get yeah destroyed for for lifetime. I kind of told them that, like, it's, don't do it anymore, you know. I can barely walk when you came in and now you're continuing. And somehow they went a bit easier on me, which I re like, I understood or decided to understand myself that this me meant that they needed me in, in, in okay shape in a way. They couldn't destroy my legs. And uh, they didn't treat James that bad this time, but they continued with Stephen. And was really, really, really harsh to him. But Stephen is, uh, is also a tough motherfucker. So he... He took his, his part of this. Um, and when they left, the guard came in again. But this time he didn't ask us if we wanted to go to the toilet or if we needed anything. This time he told us that uh, now, guys, everything changed. The Beatles just told us that uh, that you guys have been stupid. So uh, now everything changed. So they came in and they took all our food, our yeah, our games, most of the blankets everything and uh, I said now it's only two breaths a day and so we are basically back to the beginning uh, food wise only two blankets each it's up okay when it's summer but uh, and every time we had to go to the toilet which was four times a day um, we had to sit in stress position and we were going one every time 
So you basically had to sit for an entire eight guys toilet trip in stress position, uh, facing the wall, hands over your head. And they started to use like police sticks again, clubs. So every time we went to the toilet, we got beatings with the stick and we needed to, we had like, we had like a piss bucket and some other things and we needed to fill up our water bottles and we had to do all those kind of things. So we had some water inside the, 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 the room, or had a bucket to piss in inside the room. But then you knew that all the other guys were sitting in a bad position. So everything changed at that moment, right after Federico's release. And um, and some part of me knew that this was to give me the message to take out to the Brits and American governments. Come on, negotiate with us. This is not a game anymore. This is really, really, really bad. This is really serious. And um, those 14 days before I got released was the absolute worst day, worst times. Uh, mentally. Because mentally we were so scared. We lost all hopes, but the other guys lost all their hopes. I still had a little bit of hope. I still believed that I had a way out. Uh, some, somewhere I, I believed it. Uh, and I remember we were sitting, James and Stephen and Peter was very close to each other. They, um, they kept together, you know. They were very American, nice kind of. They hold each other's hands, and Peter, Peter was in a very bad shape uh, mentally. So both James and Stephen spent most of the day trying to calm Peter down, or at least to try to calm each other down, because. Yeah, all of them started to lose it at some point. You know, even James and even James and Stephen, who have been like the toughest guys so far, they were about to to lose it, to lose the hope. And I was in the other corner with uh, with with Jan, Jan and and some other guys, and and I remember I while James and. Stephen and Peter was talking in their corner. John and I was sitting and just telling stories, you know. John could ask me, Daniel, tell me a story. I don't care what it is. Just please take me out of this room just just for 15 minutes, whatever, you know. And I started to tell him all about my gymnastic career and whatever I did done in my life. and. He started to tell a lot of stories about his life, about whatever, just so we will take our mind off our current situation and all our fears of when will the guards or when will the Beatles come in, because no matter what came through the door, it was evil. There was nothing good who came in through the door. Um, so everything, all the workouts, all the games, all the laughter, all everything was just gone the last two weeks. Um, so that was when I left, that was how everything was going when I left them. And uh, I used to say to myself that these 14 days was just a way f for them to to send a message with me, you know, to make me complain and uh, com to let me explain to the governments that it is that it is serious. Um, but yeah, so I hope that when I was released, that it kind of came back to normal, you know. Even though 
it seems funny for them to hurt us. I don't think it's, I don't think they fucking give, a, give us yet. You know, I don't think they, I don't, if they have to drive like 20, 40 kilometers to come and give us, beat us up, they would rather stay home or something. So I hope, I really hope, and I said that to myself a lot, like that was just a theater. So I had a, a story to tell when I came out. That's, that's what I hope. Because the videos that appeared in you, on YouTube or whatever, you know, about the, the beheadings, you know, as far as I could see, they, they, didn't, they, they didn't look like completely damaged. You know, I, when I got released, I was, I was blue over like all over my body blue and black so i don't think that they were i don't think they were mistreated that way in in the end but that's just me that's just the way i look at it you know can you tell us the story of your letter with jim when people started to get released we decided to send out letters with the person who was released uh, or the group that was released or whatever. And in the beginning it was just small, small messages to the family saying, uh, you know, say that I love them or whatever and thinking about them, etc. Et but as the group became smaller and smaller, the Brits and Americans, they started to realize that our chances of getting a message out or sending anything to our to our families, it, it, it can be the last opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, I know that John and Steve and Peter send it out letters with some of the other guys, like well-written letters. They managed to smuggle them out in, in handwritten pieces, I think, or at least memorized. And But James, he didn't. He didn't want to bother any of us doing that for him. And, and I remember one day that I saw that John and James had been talking for some time in their corner, as they used to do sometimes, very rarely. But sometimes they had these conversations in the corners. And, uh, and after that, John, he came over to me and said, Daniel, uh, James, you want to ask you something? OK, OK. That's, that's OK. So I came over to James, and James was like, and I asked, what up, James? And he's like, oh, um, just just if if you if you want to carry out a message or something, you know. He was very he said it fa he said it fast, like like he didn't want to bother me, you know, trying to do something. And I was like, shut up, James. You know, no matter what you want to to, you know, I would give me a letter and I will take it out even if I have to shove it up my ass or whatever. So. Um, um Jim, he wrote a letter to me, like, I think, three pieces of A4. And he gave it to me. And I sat there for like 15 minutes looking at this piece of paper. And I came back to James and said, James, what language is this? Is this? You know, is that Arabic or something? Because I couldn't read his handwritings. You know, it was awful. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so did this H? Oh, that's that's an I. Okay. So slowly he he managed to to tell me what he wrote down on these papers, and and I basically just I was we were sitting there both me and him, and I would I would read it, and James would would say it to me. Um, And then we deleted something and we added something and so it would be easier for me to say and more, you know, focused on the, on his family instead of political things, you know. Not many clever people who knows everything, what's going on, you know, not all this speculation, just 
that's shorten it in so it's 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 for your family and when we when when he wrote the the letter he wrote it like he would probably never get out and then there was a period while we were uh, uh, memorizing the letter where he started to get some hope again you know again okay, it's up and down always um so ah oh, that, that sounds a bit too much so let's let's delete some of this because it's too much you know maybe i'm coming home blah 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 and then it it so the letter cha changed a little bit while we were doing it not much but just a few details and uh, but i i couldn't bring out the letter i simply i uh, didn't have the balls to or the so for those so I say I couldn't I couldn't bring out the letter. Uh, I was too afraid after these fourteen days. Uh, I was too paranoid. So I decided just to memorize as much as I could. Uh, and so me and Jim, you spend a lot of time, you know. So what what I said would be as much James's words as possible. Um, and and um, yeah. Um, and James, he felt very bad that I should use the effort of memorizing his letter. He's, he's somehow, he's too... I don't know if you can say humble, but he, in some way he's too selfless to... to make other people, you know, work on, for him on his behalf. Um, but anyway, he, he managed to, we managed to do it and, and when I got released and I think I, I think the day after my release, the same night as I landed in Denmark, uh, a very good friend of, of, of me and, and the Foley family uh, asked me to call Diane and John and tell them the letter as much as I could before I would forget it. Um, and I did so. I, I told uh, I told them everything that that I could remember and and James and everything about this letter. And um, and I I can't really I can't really remember the letter very well anymore because it's uh, it's really it's really a tough burden to to carry around in your in the back of your head uh, this this letter uh, because it, there's some you know that is this is the last the last call the last thing that ever gets out so I I, I kind of I, I said it to them I got it out and then I kind of I had to to push it away uh, to become a yeah, to try to become a, a normal person again. Um, but uh, yeah, James was not the only one who, who did these letters. There was, there was other people who, who got these letters out. They carried these letters out for others. So, but uh, that was, so it was actually John Candley's wish that I should carry this letter out more than it was James's own. Like, but of course, James, he knew that it was like after we made him do it, you know, he, he understood why, how important it could, it could be. Um, we have many, there's many ways of, of dealing with a situation like this. Uh, I believe some people are very, are very good at, at understanding the situation. Sometimes the, their understanding of the situation are so good that they can see all the danger and that, that makes it very difficult to handle the everyday life because they only think death, death, death. And some people then do, they tend to, to think more positive or try to push away the all the bad parts and um, 
and James, he managed, I think one of the reasons why he remained so strong was because he managed to think about all the good things. He saw the light instead of the dark spots, where a guy like John, he was much, much more realistic. Or, you know, it was very... So John, he, he knew when it was bad and therefore convinced James that it was bad and we needed to to take the, the opportunity to, to get these messages out because they would mean a lot to, to everybody out there. And I also believe that, that this, this letter for me personally is, has been a very, very big way for me to, to um, have been a very, very good way for me to like recover from from this madness was to tell my like when I when I told uh, the Foley family this this letter uh, their their reaction was so grateful and so powerful that I actually felt that I did something I I felt that I I actually meant something you know that that I was that yeah that I could do something, that I did, a ch that I changed something in a way. And every time I I, ha I I feel bad inside my head, I can tell myself, yeah, but then you did a few good things, you know. And all these things are very important for me to kind of accept the fact that that we or I left somebody behind. Yeah. After you were released. And Coming home, what where could you describe uh, what that was like? I mean, what's coming home after this experience? Is, what kind of uh, what does a human feel like after coming you, home? When you when you return home, actually, I. I had a lot of time to prepare myself to get released. One of the guys we were sitting with, he, uh, he, he had tried to debrief uh, other hostages returning from, from situations like this. So he had a lot of experience with how people could, could react after situations like this. So I managed to speak a lot with him about what I should be careful of, what I should do, what, what not to do. Uh, so he really taught me a lot of things that I could use on my way out and when I came out. So I, um, it, it's really difficult to describe, but one thing you feel is relieved in a in an extraordinary way, you know. The feeling of, you know, you really have to pee, you really have to pee, and then suddenly, oh, you can pee. That feeling just constantly, in a way, not the same physical feeling, but, but, but the mental feeling of, you don't think about anything, you just, oh, they could fall and a bump outside your heel, you don't, it didn't, you wouldn't notice, you know, fuck it, fuck everything. You know, no matter what happened right now, it's, it's, I don't care. You know, um, so I, I really had this feeling of being so relieved. And, um, and then things just happened fast. There was a lot of professional people taking care of me when I came out. Um, I met my sister like two hours after I crossed the border. Uh, I was I was flown back to Denmark the day after I crossed the border, met my the rest of my family and and some of the people who took care of me I knew them from before uh, I left to Syria so it was it was a mix of a lot of of very nice nice things very professional people um, and yeah one day comes two days, three days, and suddenly, yeah. 
But basically what I tried to do the most was not to change my life when I came back. I didn't want to be another person because I knew and I was told inside that I was a good person and I had a good heart. And I was told that by, by James and John and, and some of these guys that I, really, that I really care about and really knows me. So I came home with a lot of confidence in myself and I just wanted to be the old me. I just wanted to meet my old friends and we went, me and four or five friends, we went to an empty island in the middle of a, like a, a sea in Denmark and uh, we just hung out for like five days, completely chilling, walking around in speedo, shooting with bows and arrows, making bonfire, you know, these kind of things exactly as we did. Two years before, I got taken and uh, we did a canoe trips and, you know, I did all these kind of things that I used to do before and suddenly I, <laughs> I had to do, use, I don't know, sunscreen, like factor 60 or something, like three times a day, even though I was sitting inside, I had to like put a lot of sunscreen on my skin because I was, yeah. It's like a, it's like a, it's like when a, when a vampire takes his hands out in the sun. It was almost the same, you know. You could just see my hand get red because it was so sensitive, sensitive to light. So, anyway, um, I had I need sunscreen all the time. Um, and but, yeah, I was okay. I felt okay. I've been, I have been joking and talking and you know, doing what I used to do just inside a prison instead of out in the big world. So all my human skills still existed and are some of them in much better way, I guess. Um, so I wasn't disabled in any way, I think. I wasn't, the only thing was some, vi some vitamins and some, yeah lack of sun and was uh, so I was actually pretty lucky and it was easy for me to get back much easier than other people I guess can you tell us the day when you when you had found out that Jim was killed yeah we like but me and my good friend Pierre he we decided already inside a jail in Syria that if we got released uh, before we would go to the Scottish referendum to do a report because one of the guys from the jail was from Scotland and we wanted to like he asked us to go there and, and hopefully he would be there as well but he, he wasn't in so um, so Pierre and I we I went to Paris and we went to Nicolas uh, wedding uh, in in in, uh, in France and um, then we packed up Pierre's parents uh, car uh, put in a mattress and a lot of food and whatever and, and we started traveling to um, first to London where we went and we got debriefed for three days by the British police and and then we continued across Britain to Scotland and f on our way from from London to Scotland, uh, Pierre and I, we I think we've been together for one week at that time, at that moment, and both of us were we we still had hope that this could turn out okay, we st because because of the message that I took out. Uh, I was pretty sure that they wanted something out of the Brits and American. They was worth. They were worth something, in either prisoners or money or whatever. So I, 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 I continued having hope that they would make it. Uh, and both Pierre and I, we, we were kind of convinced that this was this was. We, it just needed time, and the more we could help. Whoever wanted to talk to us. Um, the better it was. 
but on our way from London to to Scotland, um, we uh, we received the. Uh, I uh, received a call from from one uh, from from my good friend that helped me when I came out, uh, and uh, and he said, Daniel, do you know why I'm calling? I said, No, I don't. And he said, um, There's just been a video published with James sitting in an orange jumpsuit, and when he said that, I knew. Basically, I knew what what he would say. I knew what what had happened, and he asked me to. Um, he sent a link to uh, a small part of the film, just the beginning, to verify if if it was James, if if there was anything that I could recognize. And, but the link wasn't working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but yeah, we, yeah, we we didn't we didn't see the the clip, but where is when he yeah we uh, uh, we shut off the phones and and James P and I was sitting there in in the car and and I I went online just to Google it or just to find some informations uh, what. What happened, and and it was very clear what what just happened, and both yeah, Pierre he started crying. Um, Pierre cried a lot, and but I I didn't I I couldn't cry I don't know why, but for me this was so. It was so very distant for me. It was so very far away. It was so unreal, you know. It, I didn't understand it, to be honest. Uh, and we called my friend again in Denmark, and yeah, we put the, the phone on loudspeaker and we spoke to, and we had like one minute of, of silence for Jim, and, and we hung on, and, and Pierre and I went to, yeah, we went to bed, we slept in the back of the car. On a mountain hill, some kind of things, um, and we woke up the next morning and we drove, like, just into the countryside, out on a field, and we parked the car. We put out all our stuff, and we was just sitting there, like, on this open field with with the view all over Britain. And it was a very cloudy day. But not completely cloudy. So the sun was coming through some places, and and we just sat there the whole day, Pierre and I, and we were destroyed by media calling all the time, and we didn't want to say nothing. We didn't want to just shut them off because then they just want to make something up. You know, we talked to them and asked them to. We spent basically the whole day trying to to make the media understand that that they couldn't speak about the others. Please, 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 don't say anything about Stephen or Peter or John or whoever, you know, don't say anything. Um, so it was very, very difficult time for, for, for Pierre and I, but I was so happy that we were together when we got this message because then we could you know, then we could talk about the feeling of not feeling anything because at some point you, your body cannot take it anymore and you just shut down and, and I was thinking like, no matter what, James ha has peace now, he's, he's in peace and he's away from all this. And uh, there's no doubt I, I would rather be, be gone than living in in this hill. Um, so, um, yeah. So Pierre and I, we, we used each other for that, for that period to, to get over this, this strange situation. 
And then, um, yeah, I, I had a very, very strange feeling inside my body for the next, like, three months or how long it was before uh, we were invited to New Hampshire to James's 41st birthday and a, a celebration mass for, for James. And, and I, when I got this inv invitation, you know, I, I looked very much forward to it because it was like, even though I had been together with, with Pierre, I still couldn't explain him the last two weeks or the last weeks that I was together with, with those guys. There was something inside of me that, that I couldn't get out. There was something that was so... There was just hooping up, or just filling inside of my head. And, and when we came to James's uh, funeral and uh, when we came to James's celebration lesson, and I saw Michael and James's brothers and and sisters and mom and dad, you know, I everything started to become real again in a way, you know, the fact that I could could recognize James in in his in his brothers it was a very a very strong feeling for me. So everything kind of became real again and. I remember myself sitting inside the church and I was like completely destroyed, you know, really, really crushed. But I got it all out. I, I, I got, I got much better after that. It was really a relief for me and the fact that I managed to say goodbye to James together with all his loved ones was really powerful feeling for me, so. Um, so I was really happy that, that I managed to get the opportunity and the invitation to come and, and say goodbye and meet all his friends and families who, who, really, who really showed how grateful they were that I took out this letter. And once again, it, it, it reminded me how important it was that that James, he, he gave that letter to me. How would you describe James's legacy? James, I believe what James leaves behind and what James will always for me be an icon of, it sounds very American, but he will always be an icon of, of of freedom in a way, you know, how important it, it is what what he is doing and when, what we is doing, you know. And he has been a symbol of of this whole issue. You know, he came to raise awareness about the conflict in Syria and, and all the things going on in that region and, and suddenly that has a face in a way. Um, that will be my that will be the the sad the sad part of it, but but for me it's 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 about you know James never James he was never angry at anybody James was never never full of hate he was never mean he was never selfish you know he James he he always managed to put himself second you know and and look for others first and for him it was it was not it was not only uh, it was not only a, a question of what to do you know it was simple for him we have to we have to push him to think of himself first or come, come on James you know don't you know take care of yourself or so, so James, James will for me symbolize, you know, this very humble and very, very humble and very um, loving, humble and loving person. Who are there for others, like, yeah, humble and loving.